Hey folks, just a quick introduction to my discussion with Ed Hartman. He is a Seattle-based composer and he got involved with a film that was made in the 1930s, but it was never actually released. It's called As the Earth Turns, and it is a fantastic old school sci-fi film made by a 20 year old filmmaker. And just the history of this film and the filmmaker in general is fascinating. So I'm gonna cut this introduction short. So now for a quick ad break and then on to my discussion with Ed Hartman. Enjoy. First, you're a composer, right? Yes. Okay. So composing, do you normally compose film scores or is it orchestra? What type of composer? Well, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, <laughs> as a mm -hmm. definition, I, I consider myself a a musician now nowadays a creator as we say in the, in the modern era um so i'm also become a filmmaker but uh the the composing side has been with me for a long time and uh since high school doing electronic music and then in college right I, I got a percussion degree as a performer although i kept writing music for my recitals just which pretty much pissed off the uh, professors <laughs> to no end because <laughs> you're not supposed to do that. You know? Yeah. They wanted you to play their stuff or the designated stuff, right? Well, yeah, they didn't know how to deal with it. So, um, but I was always into that. And then I've, I've been in bands and had my own stuff. So I, I've always been writing music of all kinds, Latin, jazz, world, electronic, classical. And in fact, when I first moved out to Seattle with a gal, um, she had a harpsichord. And so I really got into, I mean, that was a keyboard we had. And, and the thing about a harpsichord is it doesn't have a, a pedal. So there's no way to hold chords down. So you write contrapuntally a la Bach and uh, everything becomes linear. So that taught me counterpoint really well. Mm -hmm. But I've never been, I've never taken composition classes in college or anything like that. I took everything else about music, history and all the rest of it. And I, I've never really felt that composition classes are all that critical at least in my my training uh orchestration is probably something i need more of but um anyway so as far as the answer to your question uh i've been writing music all along whether it's been for my own band or for you know whatever and then in the last 20 years i've had a lot of music in film and tv through placing music through music libraries and things like that and then that started pushing me more and more into film scoring through opportunities that presented themselves somewhat related to that i got more comfortable composing and recording my own stuff because nowadays as composers we're not just sitting down at the piano and and writing a piece of music and having somebody else play it we actually have to be an orchestra <laughs> or, you know, and 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 the way i'm putting it these days is technology caught up with me so that uh you know as I, I had a port of, well, I had a port of studio cassette in the 80s that allowed me to overtrack, but it really was never the quality to quite get to CD level that you could kind of fake it. In the 2000s, I was able to get the Tascam digital port of studio, and that allowed me to start overtracking. A lot of those tracks have done very, very well to this day. As Logic came in for me, a DAW, a digital audio workstation, I was able to not only create uh, music of all kinds for orchestras and sampled instruments and stuff like that, but also score it to picture, to synchronize it, to film. And and that opened up a huge amount of th uh, doors for me. Um, so it, it's been a, a really wiggly path on how to get here. Yeah, uh, when I think yeah. music scoring, I, you know, think the old school, you have a big orchestra there, they're showing the movie on the screen and, you know, they're doing that. So a lot of modern music scoring especially for like smaller budget projects you're kind of doing all of that correct like you've got yeah, your keyboard you're, you've got you it possible to play and you know, make it sound like a, a a horn instrument is playing that type of stuff is that correct yeah i mean if we had it set up i could actually demonstrate that and and sound like a, an oboe or a violin or a full orchestra it's not easy to do and it requires another set of skills uh you have to understand how musicians play their instruments and then have to get really high quality samples. And then it has to all be 
and, you know, I mean, there's just many, many parts of the puzzle to, to have to, to deal with it. The film As the Earth Turns is a 1938 film we'll probably talk about, um, and that's my best score for sure. That's a period score. It's a, a 1930s, 40s, you know, although it's really a classical score. In fact, a lot of people, the, the comments I've heard from reviews, because I've gotten a lot of great reviews about the score, silent film, so the score is a huge part of the film, uh, say that they like it because it's a combination of an, of an older style plus more of a modern scoring technique. I'm not a big fan of uh, taking old silent movies and making really modernistic, you know, type of... Uh, scores to them i've done it and it's fun to do but what i really love to do is to see if i can't create something that's really epic in nature and that's what i tried to do with this film is come up with something that you know the music kind of stands on its own as well uh, the, there's no you know if you have silence in a silent movie it's deadly uh, especially digital if you're if you're watching in a theater you know in the old days you had a film projector that would you know there'd be hiss and ambient sounds but when you're watching a, a video and, uh, you know, whether it's on your computer or whatever, and there's no sound, there's no nothing. And the audience immediately, thinks, is there something wrong with the sound? <laughs> yeah. Well, and you might yeah. hear that with a silent film that's been rescored where kind of like there's a pause between the music, you know, maybe between one scene or another scene. Uh, yeah. I've noticed that as well. And, and in watching As the Earth Turns, I I I I I see, definitely see how you made that so that that didn't happen as it was transitioning yeah. from scenes to where the music transitioned without there being this like pause in the music and I do notice that when I watch silent films and there's that pause in the music and it makes me wonder okay are, is this how it was originally scored or is this a new score trying to sound original and right. it's not that well done that kind of thing but it is noticeable. Yeah, I mean, and if you were in an old theater and you had a live orchestra playing with it, you wouldn't have that issue because there'd always be ambient sounds. Um, now, I was lucky enough uh, because my executive producer, who's the great niece of Richard Lyford, who's this guy <laughs> up here. Um, anyway, uh, she, we were able to master the score. So it's one thing to finish the score myself and come up with it. It's another to take it to a high quality post-production studio and really bring out the, the instruments and the, the sounds. Uh, in, in As the Earth Turns, there are live sounds in there. I, I don't even want to go into which are, which are live and which are Memorex or whatever, because that might ruin it for people. I'd rather have them watch it and you know, there's an illusion. Of course, the whole, you know, movies are a grand illusion anyway. So why not make the music an illusion too? You know, it doesn't have to be just the visuals. Nowadays, everything's CGI. You don't know if anything's real, including the actors. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. So, but but I, I, I really enjoy doing it. And, and with As the Earth Turns, it's a 45-minute silent sci-fi film. And it's a really cool movie. So, um, and the backstory is phenomenal because... Richard Lyford was 20 years old when he made this thing in Seattle without any money. You know, I mean, he, he was he was working, doing jobs and stuff. But, uh, you know, this was not budget, but big, big budget. A lot of people ask, um, why was this film never released? You know, they in fact, on Amazon, like some of the reviews, people are like, I think this is a fake. You know, and I'm thinking, if I could create a film this authentic, I'd be Spielberg, man. <laughs> 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 They're just because the edits are so, you know, there and everything. And we, we didn't take him out for a couple of reasons. We wanted to show the authenticity of what he was dealing with at the time. My, my fear was if I had slicked the film down so much, people would not believe that it was real. They'd think, oh, this must be a, a digital thing. So but, did you guys um, yeah. add anything? Because I know you found some, there's found footage that was added. Did you add any of that found footage or is this the original edit? So... The way it worked out, I mean, I can go through the story from the mm -hmm. beginning, but um, the, as far as, as the Earth Turns is concerned, when I first got it, we were just kind of playing around with, she just wanted to do it over as a family archive uh, to hire me to do that. And um, and then it came out, started to come out pretty good. So, uh, sorry to interrupt there. So his niece, they just had a copy of it. It, it had never been released. And they're like, okay, you know, let's get this scored just so we can have it for ourselves kind of a thing. So they yeah. reached out to you 
to help score. Did you know her already or how, how well, did that okay. connection well, let's, happen? Let's take this way back. If you, don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, you can't start in the middle on this thing. All okay. right. So honestly, I'll try and do this quickly. But in 2013, there was an article on Classic Horror Film Board by some real, you know, hi historical archivists. And they found a, um, I can show you this. They, oops. They found a, a video DVD. I got to put it in front of me. Say there it. we go. Monster Crash. Monsters at the Crash party. the Pajama Party. Okay. <laughs> Something weird video, kind of uh, exploitation video. Yeah. And, uh, and there's a couple of scenes of some films in there, and they couldn't identify who did it. So they started doing research trying to figure out who made these little scenes. One is a mummy scene. Another is a, uh, a kind of a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde thing. Anyway, over the years, they contacted the Lyford family and the great niece of Richard Lyford. Um, she, she, she started to get involved in this, and she wound up grabbing the film estate from um, Chris Lyford, the son, for, for archive to make sure that uh, everything was okay. And so, <laughs> which I now own, <laughs> so I have... Those original films. <laughs> oh, actual can old school literal, canisters. Nice. I have boxes of these things that are needing to go to the UCL film UCLA film archive in the near future or the UW or whatever I decide. Okay, so um I teach percussion, drums and percussion. And I taught a, a student years ago, and uh his mother started to take some percussion lessons from me in 2017. And um she and I was showing her some of my stuff I was doing, and I happened to have a little music video of a Buster Keaton film with uh, a track against it. A uh, really fun little track, kind of a la Pee Wee Herman uh, style music against this Buster Keaton scene. And she saw it, and, she, and that triggered something. She said, Well, you know, I have these films. Would you be interested in scoring these? I'm like, Yes, I would. <laughs> and so I watched this thing, and there was about 30 minutes there. Um, over the next month as i was scoring it we discovered another 13 15 minutes that brought it up to 45 minutes it, it possibly was longer but we've never discovered any more footage i wound up getting involved in editing producing <laughs> and the whole thing i mean i got drafted yeah uh, and 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 this became my life for the next several years uh, aside from doing all the other thing i'm doing that's why i'm, I'm here uh so those were the, the scenes, and I, you know, I had to kind of put them together and figure out what was what because I really didn't know. But I, I was noticing that the, the original, the film I had was kind of missing some things. There were some skips, and, and I went, what was that? What, you know, and I'm trying to score this at the same time. Another really wild story about it is about halfway through the scoring, um, we had started doing more research about Richard Lyford, and he had written articles and we were starting to read them. And I was so focused on scoring, I really wasn't reading that information, but she was. And he had started to experiment with uh, dual turntables synchronized to projectors, and I found out recently even cameras, which scared the bejesus out of me because that means he had a playlist of records he was playing along, which means he had what we call reference tracks. Yeah. And and one of the problems with scoring a film with a, a director that's no longer around is you really don't know what he would like. Luckily, <laughs> the pieces he chose, like Tchaikovsky and Dvorak, were kind of close to my, my choices. So I feel good. And talking, I've done interviews with his son and all the rest of that. And I've, I've confirmed that I, I think he would be very happy with my score. Did you, how did you know those were the, the pieces that he chose to go with it? Did he have notes or something? No, we didn't. No, I'm saying we didn't know that. But my, okay. my, in my interviews with his son, he told me what he remembers I see. Uh, of, of music, musical choices that his dad was interested in and had mentioned and things like that. Um, and I've gotten really involved working on a documentary about him as well. Yeah, yeah, I saw uh, that. Yeah. Um, so w why was the film never finished? Was it because he got the offer to go to Hollywood? Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, he had done nine films before he was 20. <laughs> yeah, that's impressive. <laughs> Mind-blowing. 16 millimeter, he's pretty much developing his own film. <laughs> you know, I mean, he has a basement studio that seats 50. And um, 
I'm, I'm working on a biopic script about his first 20 years. And uh, the log line for that is Andy Hardy meets Orson Welles. And I, I'm realizing I'm, I'm dating myself by saying Andy Hardy because people look <laughs> at me funny. Andy Hardy was a character. Well, you know, give it a few years. You might be dating yourself by saying Orson Welles. So there you That's go. That's right. So Andy Hardy was a, a character uh, or Mickey Rooney played against Judy Garland, and they were always putting on a show in the backyard. It got bigger and bigger, Busby Berkeley musicals in the 30s and 40s. Richard Lyford was that with film. Each film got bigger and more people involved. And As the Earth Turns was kind of his opus. It was really his film school, you know, master's thesis. Um, and he, and he never went to film school because there wasn't no film school in Seattle in the yeah. 1930s. And uh, about the time he finished this, um, yeah, he went to uh, he got an offer to work for Disney, and um, which I've learned a lot about. And uh, there was really no way he could have distributed this anyway, even if he had stayed in Seattle. He's, you know, he, he had no studio or anything like that, no pr production company. Well, he had a production company. So anyway, he, uh, he he moved to Burbank, and I know where he lived. In fact, he lived with uh, the guy who started, um, oh, what's the the uh, big boy hamburgers? <laughs> oh, really? The hamburger chain? I'm not kidding, yeah. yeah. And another guy who, like, did photography for National Geographic. Yeah, the stories get really weird um, about that. And he worked uh, on Fantasia, Dumbo, and Pinocchio, and then uh, was drafted. And Disney handed him his drafting papers, draft papers. You know, personally, he knew him. There's wonderful stories at Disney, and one of them is part of the documentary and going to be a major part of the biopic. Um, and then he worked in the Army Air Forces uh, doing classified and war films and things like that moved back to new york and didn't go back to disney right away um and wound up uh directing an academy award-winning documentary about michelangelo uh in 1950 with robert flaherty who did nanook of the north and robert snyder who was a famous documentary direct uh, producer um, he, he wound up uh, doing more corporate stuff and then eventually um, went to the Mideast and did films in the Mideast, which were quite interesting, uh, and, and worked at Disney on some wonderful World of Color, uh, of the, kind of the animal documentaries that did well. So, so there's a mini documentary that I, I finished this year after about two, three years of research called It Gets in Your Blood. And that's been, I just got the 97th festival selection from that. You can see as I'm, I'm now going after as the earth turns records. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, that is going to be playing. I don't know when this podcast is on, but I'm, I'm going to be heading down to Burbank uh, in oct beginning of October. On October 3rd, it's going to play at the TCL Chinese Theater, Grauman's Old Theater, <laughs> which is <laughs> That's Mind fantastic I've been trying to, to get, get to that. go see a film there. Wow. I know. I've been, I've been, you know, I've had, I've, I've scored films that have played there and never gotten there. And I'm thinking, I got to go to this thing just for the photo op alone. Absolutely. And I was just in Burbank for a Burbank Film Festival that was spectacular. Really nice one there. So the, the film is, has been wonderful. We've been to Vegas with it. As the Earth Turns been an all, you know, massive amount of film festivals and won incredible awards. It's like 130 six or something um anyway uh so so that it, this one is is really and this is really kind of the proof of concept of the biopic script uh it and, and it's the first 20 years that intrigues me of what he did because uh, i think uh if you kind of think of you know tucker like the the movie tucker or yeah. uh my brilliant career you know a lot of these things like that there's there's kind of parallels to richard lyford uh on what he could have done so i'm kind of entrusted with his his archive at this point and i have to make sure that the biopic is as close as i can come to what happened and and you know i i think it's gonna my goal is to make it a fun joyful experience i'm i'm really not interested I've, I've scored a lot of dark horror and stuff like that and i if i'm going to make a movie i'm going to make something that's uplifting and 
God fun, you know? <laughs> well, that's nice, especially and with inspiring. everybody making so many dark, dreary films nowadays. But I could see how this would be fun because if you watch the film, it's 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 quite campy. You know, you think yeah. um, uh, of uh, uh, Flash Gordon Flash type Gordon, thing, you know, right. it's Flash Gordon in black and white and, yeah. and with the, the, with the model, whoops, with the model effects and stuff like that. So there's a certain campiness of it, but it works because, yeah, at that age, that's the type of films you're going to make. You're going to take your friends, you're going to put a fake beard on them because they can't actually grow a beard themselves yet and uh, put them <laughs> in your films. Uh, so, so I could see that being a fun, campy kind of a movie. You know, he did some really spectacular things. There was another film that we do not have that I wish I did called The The Sea Devil. And it was based on a German, you know, guy who used to, you know, take out boats and stuff. And a famous story. And he had a hundred people in that cast. Uh, and, and, you know, there was, I don't know how many models of airplanes and boats. And he was blowing stuff up and, you know, all <laughs> over Seattle. So, you know, he he was really ambitious with this stuff. And, you know, as much as you can forgive him for the effects and things, because he did, again, he tried to do this with, you know, just as whatever effects he could pull off. This was outside of Hollywood. You can't put it up to the same standard. Yet, as a storyteller, that's where his he excelled. And, uh, I mean, you know, there's an interesting story is when he was growing up is that he could sit in a room a book and there'd be a lineup of books and tell a story with all the people in the room as characters based on the books that he was looking at. Wow. I mean that and he wrote fifty eight stage and screenplays before he was twenty two. <laughs> so he was a writer. I mean that was that was his thing. You know? Are most of those still in existence? No. Oh can't no. find them. Yeah, I know. I, and what I have of the film estate really is just these two fragments uh, which are, oh, and, and all of this stuff, as much stuff as I could kind of pack in, is on a DVD Blu-ray. If you go to As the Earth Turns, there's links to that. And that just came out this summer. Okay. That was a job putting that together. But it has As the Earth Turns, other things, some some interesting, um, you know, backup materials, the documentaries in there. Um, you know, and I would recommend people check that out. Oh, the other really huge news is that As the Earth Turns is going to be on Turner Classic Movies on Halloween at nine o'clock Pacific, which is midnight November second East Coast, but that is just an unbelievable circumstance that is that is happening. And I was able to negotiate that with with TCM myself, which was really really nice to to pull off. How did that come about? Did you reach out to them, or did they see yeah. it at one of the festivals? Or well, I I I lobbied. <laughs> okay. I think that I think that took a year to to have come together. Uh, I got to know people there and found my way in, and uh, and just kept pushing, kept pushing, kept pushing. And as the film got more and more, you know, performances and festivals, they started to get a little more interesting in it, interested in it. Uh, and just and then it, you know, it actually was in their uh, contracts since 2020. What's kind of interesting about that is they probably originally I thought they were going to put it on last year in the fall, and it it just got pushed off. And what makes this even more interesting is on Sundays on TCM are Silent Sundays, so Halloween coincides with Silent Sundays oh, this nice. year, and that only made it more spectacular. The serendipity that's involved in this entire story is off the off the wall i mean it, it's just it's it's incredible not you know none of this should have happened <laughs> you know i mean this goes back to people all over the world finding stuff and connecting you know i this couldn't have happened in another time you know I, this this had to happen now and and richard lyford I mean, this is this took 80 years you know, from the point he, or over 80 years from the point he created this film to where it started to be seen again. And this was a film I, I know he enjoyed. He really liked it, you know, uh, as your turns. He, it was, it's just such a well-made film for what it is. And, yeah. and you know, again, you kind of start to buy in the effects and go, yeah, you know, I've, I've seen... I've seen worse in <laughs> out of Hollywood. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I've seen worse more recently than this was made right. on a larger right. budget. It's not Absolutely. CGI. This is yeah. all real stuff. Yeah. You know? Well, and it's fantastic that it is being seen now and then it was recovered because, I mean, you hear so many stories about movies throughout history that were made that 
we'll never see, you know, because of the film stock was ruined at some point in time. It was, you know, any of those kind of things that have happened to it. And for, and that, and you hear that on much more well-known, larger productions. Yeah. So something smaller like this that actually managed to be saved and is mount made available. I, I think is fantastic. I think that's, you know, stuff well, like and this and is I, I know that some of the archives are very interested in this stuff. And a lot of the films I have, and we've scanned everything. So we have everything digitized now. In fact, one of the films he did in the sixties was, um, a color 35 millimeter film for the African pavilion at the New York world's fair in 1964. And it was kind of one of those short 10 minute things. You'd walk in the pavilion, they'd show a movie about the culture and the science and all that of the era. This is a really well-made film. Ossie Davis narrates it. He had, you know, all the countries involved. Um, and it's beautiful. And it was washed out. It was red. And, um, and I brought it to a, a scanner guy, a professional place in Seattle, and they brought the color back. I couldn't believe how, the, how they do that. It just it blew my mind, and it's, it's really a nice-looking film now. So there's a lot of treasures in here. A lot of the stuff he did was for other companies, uh, educational films, things like that, things you would have seen, you know, in elementary school <laughs> about science, you know, and stuff. Uh, and, I, and I think he would have done more narrative um, you know, if he had the opportunity, but because of the timing of war and everything else that's going on, for whatever reason, he just he never he never got back to it. The the later films he did, this uh, film Island of Allah or Island of the Arabs, was done in Saudi Arabia. He was working for did films for Aramco. Um, it's a it's a beautiful picture, and and it, you know it's a story for sure, but it has narration because of dial uh, translation and all the rest of it but i know based on my discussions with his son that he would have loved to have done raiders of the lost ark or something like that and so you know i think as the earth turns it to me stands out as the closest he got to true narrative original filmmaking that wasn't necessarily based on history or you know documentary oriented or something like that and, uh, you know, unless there's something we don't know about, <laughs> there could be um, on there. But but I'm, I'm, I'm thoroughly involved in this thing. And, uh, you know, I, I hope the biopic will, will show all of this. Because I, I think for a filmmaker to watch it, uh, even just to watch the documentary, a lot of filmmakers I've shown it to are like, yeah, and I think I have had, had challenges, you know. <laughs> you yeah. make a movie with your camera with your you know with your phone you know i've done that so you know he had to he had to shoot all this stuff on 60 millimeter and and it was not easy to pull it off no well and develop it and pay for it, it and it. you know uh lighting right. back then you know wasn't to, we didn't you didn't have fancy led panels laying you know that you could order on amazon back then and he was a great artist I, I mean he could do uh his titles you know one reason why people like you can sign to see behind me that's an animated title in the movie where it's kind of exploding that sort of thing or coming back in reverse uh you know he could do stuff like that uh in his teens hmm. um and that's i i'm sure another reason why disney was was very interested in him um but i i think that that also got him work around town doing signs and and stuff like that uh, I'm, I'm beginning to learn a little bit more about that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that, that, that gave him a visual eye for, uh, the scene and uh, because there's some, like in, as the earth turns, there's a scene that's just awe inspiring after a big earthquake in the white house where the, there's two aides or two, two of the, um, European generals fighting it out staring at the president in the middle and they just kind of look at him and I, there's just something eerie i had to put a really intense piece of music under that because it just to me that's a moment in that film that just you know is everything on there did he i mean did his family have money because you because i mean the locations he had a lot of locations the props even the, there's the scene with the reporter driving around. That's a pretty nice car that they're rolling around town in. Yeah. So I'm curious. And I know his parents were in the lumber business. Is that correct? Yeah. They, they had money, you know, according. And, and I, that, this, is a, this is a big question for me because it really does 
change how the story evolves on on what you understand about it. It didn't necessarily mean he had access to that money, right? Of course, yes. uh, but no, they he had a family of you know there were four kids and and I, they were I think what would have been more of a middle class existence now. So I don't think they were necessarily you know high end rich or anything like that. Uh, I think later some of the family made some money here and there, but not not necessarily. I, I think. Uh, the the father was kind of in the like a more of a scientist for lumber business did research and things like that but they did okay i think the car was a friend of his uh, okay. family or something like that uh, but what he did was able to do was to use locations i mean there's a there's a scene at a place called gasworks it's still around in seattle it's an old gasification thing and they literally were running away from the guards <laughs> way out. I mean, they were guerrilla filmmaking all the way. There's a scene um, where he, the, the radio guy is picking up the messages from Pax, who's kind of the Dr. Evil character yep. that Lifeford plays. I've discovered, we figured this out, um, that there, a house maybe a few blocks away um, was run by, this is phenomenal, 10 years before that movie, there was a guy who was a well-known politician in Seattle, but he wound up going to jail running uh, a gin mill or whatever, you know, he's, you know, he's bootlegging. Right. And he was also kind of a, a radio guy, he'd create his own little radio station. That was that room, I matched the drapes. So that when this guy was probably in jail by now, but that room still existed, and that's where they wound up filming that interior. So there, there's just incredible little, you know, when you start yeah. looking at every scene at Boeing Field or whatever. He's, he's well, in that's a plane. another one exactly because there's this stuff of them getting on the on the airplane there. Yeah, he had access to that stuff, and he was into planes big time. That okay. whole, you know, that whole family was always into air, air you know, and Boeing's were. You know, they, they were all part of what's going on at that time, you know. So, again, I, I think they had friends and connections and things like that. But in the end, he still had to work his tail to, to have all that stuff. Um, and, you know, it was not easy. And, and everybody got involved. I mean, the, you know, the mom was making dresses and things like that. So, or, you know, costumes, <laughs> you know, but some of this stuff had to be done in mass. I mean, for that sea devil, they had a hundred, you know, costumes and, and makeup. And you know, <laughs> that takes some time to do that. I, I think that film actually in the end took about three years to finish. Um, he had to keep coming back to it. Cause you know, so he really, I, I think he was working on multiple projects at times. And some of his stuff won awards and, uh, you know, that, I mean, in 1936, a hundred dollar award was worth a grand at least, you know, so, uh, that, that gave him some, some working capital. And I do know, you know, from resources of the family that throughout life, any money he had immediately went to the next production, <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> <laughs> which is classic filmmaker. One yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. He must, yeah, and he must have been a very charismatic person as well, just yeah. to get that many people to work with him and stuff. So he was, and the and the, in the you know some of the other family members, uh, nieces of his, and things like that, always considered him a really wonderful, warm guy. And um, you know, I, I I think he he was always entertaining, and he he generally led a fairly happy life. Uh, you know, although I I think later there were issues with health and. Um, who knows? <laughs> and that's one reason I'm, I'm afraid to go beyond his 20th year, you know, when he goes to Disney, because I just don't know enough about that. And I, I that starts getting into times where, I mean, it, you know, who knows? I, the, the, if the biop gets produced of the first 20, maybe it becomes a, a miniseries and it, it gets yeah. a further, but it may become more speculative. And, and I, I, you know, it could be a much more dr dramatic and serious film watching the development of a, a filmmaker who is on a very different trajectory than what he might have thought it was going to be. And, and I, I speculate that being at Disney, Disney is not known for developing filmmakers. Uh, it happens, but you don't know who went, went there. In other words, Disney is not the, they're not going to put the, the, the light on people that are working there. It's a team effort. And the only person you ever hear about at Disney was Disney. Yeah, <laughs> it was. Oh, it's a Disney movie. Now with Touchstone and all these other brands that they've created, they've created much more of a distribution network. You know what's been so cool for me is 
because during As the Earth Turns uh, Festival run, I was in L.A. a number of times. We actually submitted that film to the Oscars <laughs> in 2019. This is off the charts, too, because, it, first of all, it's free. It doesn't cost any money to do it. <laughs> uh, and, and because the film was 45 minutes, it qualified as a feature. I didn't realize that, but anything, I think it was 40 minutes or something. It all, being 45 minutes was interesting from a festival run because some festivals considered it a short, you know, it was like, I could kind of double yeah, my efforts it, that way. That, that annoying period where like, it's yeah, too long to be a short, <laughs> but too, you know, too short to be a, a feature. Yeah. And, it, and it's not a practical film in a theatrical thing, but what, so if you're going to do an Oscar run, in the 2019, not pandemic, where you couldn't do it, but you had to do a theatrical. So we did a seven-day theatrical in Glendale, California, at the Lemley Theater there, the chain of the Lemleys, which goes back to the, you know, uh, F Phantom of the Opera, or what, not Phantom of the Opera, um, uh, Dracula, you know, Carl Lemley. Um, anyway, and as it turned out, the theater was one block away from the YMCA that Lyford stayed at when he first got to L.A., and so I visited them and talked to people there. So, uh, you know, I and, and I was just in Burbank and I, I drove by his his place he first lived. And and I'm thinking, man, I am walking the streets. He was walking back and forth to Disney and Buena Vista Studios and drove by there. And, you know, my goal is to get in the gates there in the near future and discuss this biopic idea so that that's where this is all hopefully leading i don't know if i'll have luck at that or not uh, i my my vision is that it would be a combination of a hollywood and a seattle production because i think it needs to be filmed here and there are great locations for it to happen well guess what park to... is still there just looks a little different yeah i mean you could work with it you, the interiors and all the rest of it but that that's the goal and and um you know, I don't, I don't know where that's going. As a, as a composer, I continue to score films. Um, I, you know, what's wild for me and my own trajectory is that I was interested in Super 8 film as a kid, and I still have those cameras. Um, and I was always frustrated that I couldn't get sound with them. I would put records with them eventually reel to reel, but I couldn't synchronize anything. It was like hitting buttons at the same time. And, uh, and so I went into music full time, but I almost went into filmmaking. I mean, that was a real serious shot and it would have been Cal arts that I was eyeballing, but I wound up going to Indiana for percussion and music. Uh, and the interesting thing about that is my mother's cousin was Harv Bennett who, uh, produced rich man, poor man, mod squad, $6 million man, Star Trek two through six. He saved Star Trek. I mean, yeah. he literally is the guy. The reason why all Star Trek movies exist, all <laughs> things Star, of Star Trek, Trek too, is it was because of Harv Bennett saved it. I mean, Paramount came to him and said, "Hey, we need you to do this." <laughs> came up with Wrath of Khan with with uh, yeah, you know. Anyway. Yeah, no, I know. Yeah, we're gonna make another Star Trek movie. We're not gonna give you nearly as much money, and it's pretty right. much your last chance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, I would have had a heck of a you know, connection there. So, you know, this is, this is my brilliant career. <laughs> no, I understand. Into filmmaking yeah. later, you know. How is his family responding to all of this, uh, the, the film and all of the work that you're doing? Well, there's not many around uh, okay. in the Lifer family. Did uh, he have, well, he had a son. He had a son and the daughter is no longer around. And, okay. and then I get as a niece uh, that I know. They love it. They, okay. I mean, the thing is, is um, my co-producer of all this stuff has been incredibly supportive on this. I could have, I could not have done this myself in any way. And in fact, you know, <laughs> uh, I know, I mean, I, it's just, it, it, it just wouldn't have happened. And to this day, they're, they're continuing to support things that are going on. So I, I'm, and I, I've try and check everything out with them as, as I go. Cause I don't want to do anything that is uncomfortable for anybody. And, and yeah. one concern is if I bring in other production companies, will they change the storylines to say, well, we got to Hollywood it up, you know, yeah. we, need, we need some more drama here. We need some yeah, conflict. Yeah. That and didn't I understand actually and that's a concern of mine because there is not necessarily a lot of death in this story. Uh, you know, and, and the, the kind of things that you kind of need. But I, I think, again, if you look at the movie Tucker, 
that's a film that has a really joyful kind of a th- message. He had problems, but yeah. it wasn't a matter of somebody dying. It was a matter of fighting, you know, big companies, yeah, big companies. And 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 in this case, it was kind of the fighting the technology and all the rest of it. I, I think that'll be the thing, and just what, his process of what he had to do uh, and put this stuff together. I, I you know, for him to pull this off, just the amount, the sheer amount of films and screenplays and storytelling ability. I think that's what's going to carry it. I had a thought recently about uh, there's a the scene where he's telling a story based on books in the room, and it came to my mind knowing his artistic abilities because he did some cartoon stuff. I, I think he could have become an animator. He might have done some for Disney. I don't I don't know. But my, my thought is is rather than just telling the story in a library setting, to actually have it animate in an early Disney style. Mm. as that as a story i think that would be delightful you know so i think those are ways uh, you can take a story like this and make it really fun to watch you know it's it's definitely you know going to be something that's going to have a beginning middle and an end and and the way i've designed the story is pretty much done i'm just trying to flush out the, the you know the harder parts are how to shoot scenes from the films he did to reenact them and what will be interesting about that is if you really want to do it right, you kind of have to use the technology he uses, you know, or it's going to look ridiculous. And that doesn't mean everything has to be shot on 16 millimeter, but you're, there's going to have to be some models made and, uh, you know, and explosions and stuff like that, you know. And, and I, I've seen too many fake explosions lately on TV and stuff. You know, they're getting kind of lazy about that stuff. Yeah. You know, you watch a thing and, and there's this flash in the back and it's obviously not even real. <laughs> and you're like, right. I, I rant on. about it all the time. Like, yeah, it, it's, yeah. it's, yeah. I mean, you watch, yeah, but I'll just use Star Wars as an example. Like, I mean, you watch the original Star Wars compared to, you know, the way he changed it or any number of other things that have come out now. And it's like, you know, it's because they used real models and the stormtroopers mm-hmm. had actual people in the costumes and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Whereas now it's all CGI'd and it, it doesn't age well. And and those models have to be of size or yeah. they, they're not, you know, and, and he's, you know, he's shown holding some of these things. So you get a sense of it. You know, the, I know like with Star Trek that the, the Enterprise was pretty sizable. Yeah, the original one sizes. was huge. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You couldn't ha- hold it, you know. No, it was, it was massive. Yeah, but I, you know these weren't of that level. But I'm I'm impressed, and he blows stuff up. So he had to blow up some of those models. I mean, that they're just thinking about that. These a lot of these would have been wood too. I mean, you know, you couldn't just go and buy a, a plastic model kit necessarily. He somebody had to create these things. I you know I'm not I'm still mind blown on how did he make this stuff? And, yeah, and, well, know. exactly. And it's impressive too, that he was willing to destroy his stuff that he made, you know, cause it's like, well, can't use that for the next film. Like uh, the, the train going off the bridge into the lake right. kind of thing. You know, yeah. it's like, there goes that train. Well, yeah. And just that, that whole that. trestle, you know, mm-hmm. how he designed that and he put some blended, some real footage in there and it, yeah, you know, it looks a little fudgy, but man, you know, you buy it, you go, okay. You know, it's intense. I, I think the phenomenal aspect of this story is the sympathy one builds up for the uh, for Pax by the end. I, I think that is really spectacular. I think yeah. you, you, you have done something. If you can do this in a silent movie, you know, on a short story like this, uh, and, and somebody who's done honestly horrific things you know <laughs> if, you, if you start thinking about what he did you know based on the the story and then yeah. by the end you're kind of rooting for him you know like wow <laughs> pretty impressive yeah. yeah that is good so where can people find the film if they want to see it turner classic movies on the 31st of october yes yes so it'll be again nine o'clock Pacific time and then midnight East Coast. And it'll be on a few more times on Turner Classics. As the Earth Turns is also on Amazon and Tubi and Google and YouTube. It's through Indie Rights, a distributor. It's a really interesting distributor. Um, and then my documentary, if you go to edhartmanmusic.com. Sorry to interrupt. How did you find oh. the distributor? I'm always fascinated how people find uh, distributors for their for their films, I think. Well, I we did a lot of research and actually got help finding that from somebody. Okay. Uh, uh, there was another one I I 
I could have gone with, maybe should have, who knows, I don't know. Um, it, the, the thing about, I'm, I'm like Lifer. I'm kind of my own guy. I'm, I'm not sure I'm ever cut out to work for companies and things like that. I've always kind of run my own business. I ran a drum shop for 25 years. Hmm. Um, so Indie Rights is a do-it-yourself kind of distributor. They, they take a very small percentage comparatively, uh, but you actually still have to do a lot of the work. And just prepping. What, what you learn ab- about as a filmmaker, being a filmmaker, is not just shooting a film as a director. It means you have to take all these assets and get them to the distributor. And that that's a f- and to festivals, you have to understand what we call a DCP, which is a digital cinema package. All sorts of ways of getting your film uh, finished and then put into distribution. And uh, it, it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, just getting the DVD worked out took a number of people to help to author the DVD, to do the artwork. Um, you know, and I, I did as much of I, as I could. And, and I, I've learned a lot through the festival submissions on, on putting together PR, which I was always somewhat okay at. Uh, but just that ability to do that, you have to take all this stuff and, and keep reorganizing it. With my, my documentary, I've gone through the same process. The doc wasn't designed to be distributed originally. I just did it as a support for As the Earth Turns, as a mm-hmm. kind of a backup, you know, back uh, story for that. Uh, and it's turned into a life of its own, being in all these festivals. And I, my goal is to combine it gets in your blood as your turns and others and actually do more theatrical presentations and i'm starting to get some interest in that and offering that to organizations film maybe film uh history organizations retirement centers things like that i've done a few presentations live or online um, cause I love telling the story about the film and the filmmaker and that makes a really interesting presentation, yeah. uh, as opposed to just watching kind of a movie and going, what was that? Y- you start learning about this and you have a tremendously different view of the film afterward. I mean, I'm again, as entrenched as anybody. And, uh, so when I watch the movie more and more, I keep getting more into it going, wow, I didn't even think of that. How did that happen? So anyway, Ed Hartman music is my website. And, um, and I have a podcast. I talk to filmmakers. I'm trying to learn as much as I can about filmmaking. So it's a cheap way to do that <laughs> and hopefully get them to hire me to score films. Yeah. <laughs> I don't what's, tell them. What's that. the name of the podcast? Uh, Ed Hartman's Wild World of Music and Film. Music is first, <laughs> <laughs> being a composer. So anyway, It Gets in Your Blood has a link on that page. They're both kind of connected. Um, okay. And that film is online quite a bit on film festivals right now. So you can probably catch it somewhere. If somebody's really interested in seeing it, they can get the DVD Blu-ray or they can contact me and I'll probably send them a link. They can watch that as well. With, but, the, uh, with, the, blue, yeah. with the DVDs, do, is, how does, is that like a print on the demand thing or yeah. is your garage yeah. full of DVDs? No, no, no. Okay. I, I went through that with CDs and, you know, in the 80s and 90s and records and i i'm not going to stockpile physical product anymore no yeah. way in hell yeah so uh no the, the on demand is perfect because you can order it and they they come it takes a, it's a couple days to get them so yeah. it's it's really pretty easy sort of thing um it's ideal and and i think for older archive projects like this historic history buffs love having the physical product for that and i think what i have to offer with this one is all the extras that are in there i mean it's about Boy, it's about 80 minutes or something like that. I don't know, 70, 70, 80 minutes of of material in there because of all the stuff I threw in there. And these little short films, Ritual of the Dead and The Scalpel, are quite good. And they were done before as the Earth turns in his teens. Man, they are cool. There's transitions that took six hours to make, you know, uh, mind-boggling stuff in there. And, And that's why these original archive buffs got into this because they were watching this stuff and, and seeing it from a filmmaker standpoint what was so frustrating about when i first saw it on on this crazy dvd um mm-hmm. is that the music was just junk music against it it didn't you know and i'm thinking wow here's what's phenomenal about the the serendipitous moment there's also a backstory if you go to as your turns there's a link to the backstory that i wrote for stage 32 that goes through every detail of this just for the archive so when i'm dead somebody knows how it happened <laughs> but what's really ultra bizarre about this is this company this uh, something weird company 
I had contacted and and I wasn't getting anything in return. I, I remember watching something weird. It was on a cable. Uh, you could watch a channel, and it was kind of weird. You know, like actually, what's kind of funny about it is, you know, uh, it, it was kind of like Mystery Science Theater without the you know the catchy oh, without stuff. the commentary. It was the real yeah. stuff, and yeah, and they, they're actually showing just the films. Yeah, just kind of dumb educational movies, possibly stuff that Lifer did. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, as it turns out, that company is based in Seattle, something weird. And the guy who started that company passed away. And and I, I finally was able to connect with his, his widow. And I was able to get this film that I just got from them because we were trying to track it down just so because we didn't have that one. Uh, so we could scan it correctly and all the rest of that. She was two miles away from my house. <laughs> wow, the whole time. <laughs> and I went over there and she found it. And I, 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 that is unbelievable. Yeah. You know, I mean, not even close to where Lyford lived in Seattle. I'm on the north side. So, you know, it, just, it didn't make any sense. So she was gracious enough to give it to us. And, and we, you know, I was like, sure, keep it on the DVD. We're going to mess with that. But I own the, the LLC of uh, A Sense Productions, which owns the film estate of Richard Lyford and the film stock on all that too. So, um, you know, above and beyond my, my composing, my goal is to, the trifecta is to, to create the biopic. And, and then really, I think I have something that's very interesting that you don't run into. I, I think having a film like As the Earth Turns set up a potential release of a of a of a you know feature film is okay. pretty amazing to have and that just doesn't happen very often this is like finding an orson welles movie it really is and in fact the, that orson welles movie that came out uh, the other side of the wind or something i watched that it's a really wild bizarro movie about la and hollywood with john houston and stuff and that was found after a measly 50 years or something and we beat him with either 50 we got 80 whatever <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And he died the same year as well. He was almost yeah, identical in age. So is he know, buried in Seattle, or did he die in New York? Because he's he's been he was all over the place. Yeah, he was. No, I I'm still trying to figure exactly out where it was, but I oh. I think yeah I think West Coast, but um, oh, not sure. Oregon, I can't remember what what his son said. I gotta I gotta track that down myself on there. But uh, the the family is interesting. Um, my my co producers father was uh chuck lyford who was a famous hydroplane and plane racer and he mm. he died in a in a plane in a crash um but um and and he was really well known there's a story there that needs to happen i mean there could be a biography about that that's a fascinating family well yeah yeah they were they were they were out there i mean they were doing stuff so that that there the, that <laughs> what i keep hearing from the lifer it's like well, that's a Lyford thing. <laughs> I mean, I, that, I, I think it was Chuck who his remains were, the reason I, I think about it was were blown out of a, a cannon uh, over the sound. <laughs> you know? Did he, we, a, with the race that he died, was it in Seattle then? Was it a seafarer or something? No, no, no. It was, it was in Spokane a few years ago. Oh, okay. I think it was a plane. But um, no, so it's, again, it's a, it's an intriguing family. I, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of sides to it. And I, I think Richard Lyford was kind of the the optimist, the fun guy, the one who just was out there. He, he And I, I think where the drama happens in the biopic is his dad trying to get him to go into the timber business. I've heard it's not the lumber business. You got to call it the timber business. Oh, okay. <laughs> And uh, and he you know he just wanted to make movies and stuff and you know, <laughs> so there there's going to be some some uh, drama well, there yeah there's sure. some drama there exactly and then yeah, hopefully, and hopefully it gets him, made and hopefully Disney decides to do it I mean that would be the perfect place for it since he actually worked there I mean there that, that well at, at some point if if we do it, it there has to be some suggestion of of the scene the beginning of the end of the movie is going to have to start there so uh, where he does something quite spectacular. Yeah, I, I don't know, you know. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I got to be careful. I it's got to be a balance between that and because if Disney you know, steps in, how much control are they going to want of it? Yeah, you know, or any any major, you know, studio, yeah, studio like that. 
you know, I, I don't know. We'll, we'll find out. I, I, you know, I, you look at that picture and you tell me who should play him. Life or there, you know, anybody come to mind? Uh, is somebody supposed to come to mind instantly when I see that? I'm just curious. I'm curious. There's, there's two people that have come to mind to me. Um, and I, they just have disappeared. Um, one is a, an up and coming filmmaker, Jim Cummings. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Jim Cummings, actually. Thunder Road. I actually had some yeah. music in some of his projects. He Did you? put in, and I think he could do this. I'm, you know, the problem is this guy, there's going to be two or three people to play him growing up, but when he's in his teens, I think somebody like Jim's not too old. He could probably pull it off. The other one is I'm, I'm, who is the Saturday night live guy? Um, who went on to, He's got his own show and stuff now. Not Jason, but um, he did a lot of impressions. Vincent Price and people like that. Oh, uh, yeah. I know who you're talking about. Um, I, I think he may be getting old for that now. If it was a full, if it was his full life, he could do it. But the well, key Jim is Cummings that, might uh, work, too, because he's not yeah. as huge as the other. God, what is that guy's name? <laughs> Y'all remember now. I know. Now. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> you know, Jim is still in kind of the indie movie scene. well i think i think jim would relate to he is kind of the closest thing i've come to richard Lyford. he's amazing at being able to he's created a proof of concept you know short that went to sundance won that and that created his film but he's all about his self, self-funding just make the damn movie is his his point of view is his wonderful filmmaker so you know i that would be wonderful to have somebody like that you know, that might want to run with something like this. I, I don't know. You know, I could I direct it? I, I don't know. I, I'm just, I don't have enough faith in me. I don't have enough experience <laughs> to pull that off. I, I would like to be composer and producer, a producer, and then get really sharp producers along with that as well. Uh, all right, Ed, it's been fantastic talking to you. Uh, you. Best with the film and the biopic and all future endeavors as well. Uh, so I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, just uh, send anybody to either of these, asyourturns.com or at hartmanmusic.com. And I'm always easy to connect with on LinkedIn and Facebook and things like that. And then if you're, anybody's in L.A., Sunday, October 3rd, 2, two o'clock at the Chinese Theater, think Blazing Saddles, <laughs> you know, with the hands and all that, I will be there. Uh, showing this thing. And what's interesting is that it's going to be shown before a long, a long documentary about kind of a beauty and health magnet guy, Vince somebody. Anyway, looks like a very interesting film. So I, rather than having kind of a block of a bunch of short films, mine's going to kind of open for something fairly big on there. Um, so I, I think it's going to be a good program. I'm very interested to watch that thing. Anyway, but I'm happy to meet people there. And beyond that, who knows, you know, where, where this winds up or all of these things. And, and if people have any organizations out there, especially film groups or people that are interested in silent movies, I'm, I'm really happy to present this either virtually or hopefully in person uh, in theaters. And even in th old theaters that are, are looking for films to show, I, I have a group of films that can really make an interesting presentation. Perfect. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Appreciate it.